Good evening, everyone. The uh, bells uh, from the church across the street just chimed seven o'clock, and they always run late, so I figure we're at a good place to start. Welcome, everyone. I'm Jared Santek, Artistic Director at Right On Door County. Thank you for joining us for this reading by Mark Wunderlich from his new collection, God of Nothingness, just out from Grey Wolf Press. Mark will uh, read for about 20 minutes and then we'll be joined by his editors, Chance Erlin and Jeff Schatz for a conversation about the process that went into making this book. You're welcome to type your questions for any of our presenters into the chat box and we'll get to as many of those as we can this evening. We have more than 100 people joining us from across the country so we may not have time to get to everyone's questions or comments. Wherever you are, you can take part in Write On programs, which are all online for the foreseeable future, as it seems just about everything is these days. Mark will be offering a four-week poetry masterclass, which will begin in late February. Applications for that program are due this Saturday. Poet Athena Kildegard presents a free program for us on February 6th on the intersection of poetry and music as part of our involvement in the NEA Big Read Door County. Athena will also be leading a class on poetry revision that starts on February 9th. And watch our website February 3rd for a special video release by our recent Poets in Residence talking about the influence of other art forms on their poetry. We have many opportunities coming up for writers of all ages in all genres, so please visit our website for details. Members of Write On receive a 10% discount on all of our registrations as well as other benefits, and membership is a wonderful and affordable way of showing your support for the work that we do. If you're unfamiliar with Write On, we are both a nonprofit writing center and a writer's residency program on Wisconsin's Northeast Peninsula. We have 39 acres of open meadow, old orchard and hardwood forest. So for those writers out there, if you need an inspirational setting to focus on your next project, I encourage you to look into our program. We welcome applications from emerging and established writers for residencies ranging from one week to one month. And we also welcome applications from literary arts administrators. So Chance and Jeff, I hope sometime we might see the two of you here as well. Right on is on land that is home to the Potawatomi, as well as the Winnebago Ho-Chunk, Ojibwe, Nokwe, Sauk, Menominee, and Ottawa people. We acknowledge this space as their land and their home. It is now my pleasure to introduce our reader for this evening. Mark Wunderlich was born in Winona, Minnesota and raised in rural Fountain Lake, Wisconsin, which I think will be familiar to many of our participants this evening. His collections of poetry include the Anchorage, winner of the Lambda Literary Award, Voluntary Servitude, and the Earth Avails, winner of the Rilke Prize. And now this wonderful new collection, God of Nothingness. Mark joins us from his home, a 300 year old stone house in New York's Hudson Valley near the village of Catskill. I am so grateful to host this reading for a remarkable poet and a wonderful person. Please welcome Mark Wunderlich. Thank you so much, Jared, and um, thank you to, um, to Chance and to Jeff for joining me here tonight. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be even uh, have my digital imprint beaming into Door County, um, which is a place where I actually uh, was taken as a child on vacations, and, um, and it's a place that's very Kind of dear to me in a in a in a distant and nostalgic way, and this is a really lovely way to reconnect with it. 
Um, and I'm and I'm so happy to be to be here with um, uh, two of the of of the real kind of champions of of poetry, Jeff Schatz and Chance Erlin from Grey Wolf Press. So it's it's a delight to to do this. Um, I'm going to read um, a few poems from the collection, and um, and I. I there are a lot of elegies in this book, and so I'm going to begin with one of those. So uh, this is one that, um, kind of a poem, an early poem for the book, and it was written for Lucy Brock Broido, who was my teacher and mentor uh, when I was in graduate school, and uh, she died in 2018. And it's called Gone is Gone for Lucy Brock Broido. I was there at the edge of never of once been, bearing the night's hide stretched across the night sky, awake with myself, disappointing myself, armed, legged, and torsoed in the bed, my head occupied by enemy forces, mind not lost entire, but wandering off the marked path ill advisedly. This March, Lucy upped and died and the funny show of her smoky-throated world began to fade. I didn't know how much of me was made by her, but now I know that this spooky art in which we staple a thing to our best sketch of a thing was done under her direction. And here I am at 4 a.m. scratching a green pen over a notebook bound in red leather in October. It's too warm for a fire. She'd hate that. And the cats appear here only as apparitions I glimpse sleeping in a chair. Then, wohin bist du entschwunden, I wise up. Know their likenesses are only inked on my shoulder's skin. Their chipped ash poured in twin cinerary jars downstairs. Gone is gone, said the goose to the shrunken boy in the mean-spirited Swedish children's book I love. I shouldn't be writing this at this age or any other. She mothered a part of me that needed that, lit a spirit lantern to spin shapes inside my obituary head, even though I'm nearly certain now she's dead. Jared mentioned Fountain City, Wisconsin, where I grew up, a town of 700 people and shrinking. Um, it's right on the Mississippi. And this is a poem. You know, as so many of the, the there have been a few of the kind of early reviews of the book, all, all have referred to the, 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 the poems as being folkloric and that there's a sort of fairy tale quality to them, but this is nonfiction. So I have to say this book and it's, um, the title of this poem is Ha Ha Little Hunchback. Ha ha little hunchback, look at him pretend to trip teeth in his pocket, ring the doorbell three times and make the children clap. He taught me to run the bandsaw and run the chainsaw, cut a key from a blank key, how to break into a car through the window without breaking the window. He fixed slot machines and gumball machines, made mechanical decoys with pulleys and weights. Verstehst du, Bub, he'd ask, and I'd nod, but I usually didn't understand the little hunchback. At nine, I couldn't drive, so he taught me to drive. We'd cruise the corn stubble with the noses of our midget guns poked out the windows of the Jeep. His, the Black Prince, mine, Little Red Fox, blocks on the pedals so both of us could reach. We'd shoot squirrels and we'd shoot roughed grouse. And when I shot a pheasant cock, he had the feathers made into a fancy band for a hat. Good enough for who it's for, he'd say, tapping in a crooked carpentry nail. He made his money in moonshine sugar, made his money making bad luck loans, hired a giant everyone called Tiny. Then he became Tiny's home. His teeth pinched so he didn't wear them. His idea of a lady's gift was a meat slicer he knew she'd have to wash. But who wouldn't want to ponder a moon of pink baloney slipped fresh into an outstretched palm? 
As a child, he'd hitch up his angry pony and beat it all the way to the train to fetch the bales of tobacco and haul them to the shop. If he dawdled and was late, Grandpa Adolf would unbuckle his wooden leg and leave it napping in a chair, then beat his little hunchback with a cane. Little hunchback, little hunchback, never you be late again. This poem begins with a quote from the Gospel of Luke 15, verse 11, uh, from the prodigal son. The poem is called The Prodigal. A certain man had two sons. I am the one who stayed, did as he was told, remained behind with his straight A's, goody two-shoes, Mr. Butter wouldn't melt. I felt all the resentments stockpiled by anyone that clean and good with my outstretched organized calendar, color-coded tabs, balance, checkbook, money in the bank. Unthanked, I took the old women to church, lurched through the fellowship hall to clean up after volunteer lunch. It was I who put down the incontinent dog, drove the old man to Rochester through sleet, then went to work managed the accounts, sold off the machinery, and got a good price. It must be nice to be so very absent, not return the call, spending fall and winter doing as he pleased, dancing high and costumed in the desert dust, burning man's skeleton ablaze. Meanwhile, on planet Earth, I got the leaves cleaned up and prepared to shovel snow. Here I go, back to Lake Winona Manor, to mush through another hour of gun smoke and soft brown food, sipping a plastic cup of milk while willing my bruise-colored mood away. How easy it was to stay, to suffer nobly and alone. How simple to be useful to the infirm, keep the whispered vigil, pat the dying man's hand. A relief to wake worried about the crop, spend the morning oiling tools, sweeping up the shop, while he spends the bail money I sent parachuting from a plane. For years, we didn't hear from him, though he cashed the birthday check, while we imagined him as some wreck sleeping on a bus. We, all of us. And so he returned, welcomed warily by our dwindling clan to shake his dying dad's hand. Here I stand in the background, frying the fatted calf in grease while he weeps for what was lost for himself and with evident enviable release. Here's a little Wisconsin Gothic for you. Not like the others weren't, but it's, I, I don't really have anything cheerfully for you this evening. But so this one is probably is, I don't know if I need to give a content warning here. Um, I won't, it's a poetry reading, so we can kind of give it a blanket kind of content warning. But um, this is, this, uh, this poem, uh, it was my sort of attempt at rather somewhat loose um, heroic couplets. And uh, it's, um, it's also, uh, it, it's inspired by uh, John Clare's The Badger, which is one of the saddest poems in the English language, I think. But anyway, this is, this is my version. It's called Cuthbert. I had a lamb and named him Cuthbert. Cuthbert was what I named my little lamb. I fed him oats and I fed him corn. I fed him on the clover flush with spring. I pet and patted Cuthbert every day, fed him on the brightest summer hay. Cuthbert, little Cuthbert, how he grew. I knew then what Cuthbert didn't know. I trained Cuthbert daily for the fair, led him with a gleaming halter in a ring. Spring drew on and dully led to summer. My little lamb was now a market weather. We took him in a trailer to the show. He bedded down in bright sawdust in his stall. 
I blackened Cuthbert's pretty cloven hooves. I carded Cuthbert's haunches with a comb. I oiled his black muzzle until it shone. And the day came to take him to the ring. The livestock judge opened Cuthbert's mouth, examined Cuthbert's single row of teeth. He patted hands on Cuthbert's meaty loin, moved us into a single showman's line. The judge returned, walked off, came back again, pulled us from the lineup and then said, this market weather was the finest in his class. That night I put Cuthbert on the block. The auctioneer sang the money from the crowd. Cuthbert stood tensely and I was proud. A banker bid the highest for the lamb. I led him through the sawdust to his pen, fed him a laudatory meal in his pan. By morning, the stalls stood empty in a row, and we children were invited to the show of the carcasses of market lambs and hogs, of Hereford steers trained docile as a dog, the bodies stripped of hides hung on their hooks, we filed past them, casting furtive looks. The carcasses, bright surfaces white with fat, the room chilled cold enough so that the meat we grew stayed incorruptible and fresh. We exited the abattoir's cold light, and in the concrete hallway was the sight of heads struck dumb and staring by the door under plastic sheeting on the floor to be taken to the mink farm, we were told, for every precious portion had been sold. His head looked out at nothing he could see. Cuthbert, little Cuthbert, you have nothing left for me. And I'll just read one more. This is the last poem in the book. And uh, it's a poem that's based on one by C.D. Wright, a poem that I really admired. And, um, and this concludes the book. It's called, To Whom It May Concern. In the Polaroid in the drawer of the house, the other relatives picked over. I'm the blur in the background, mop of silvery hair. The rasp of the ash pan when you empty the stove is a bit like my voice, stuck in the chimney like a nest. You won't have to know how I procrastinated of my abiding fear of snakes or how I gave terrible presents when I bothered to give them at all. I was told by a psychic to remember the unloved dead, and so I did, but not in a way they would like, recalling how they got ugly when they drank or stole the loose change from the laundry when they thought nobody saw. I spent years writing my last letters, writing off the debt of a cold bed, pretending I was busy when really I was home pinned to the couch by a cat. For money, I did many things, trapped muskrats, forged thank you notes, let men pet me while I danced. Mostly, I played the role of someone who cared, tilted in my chair and trying to appear engaged, the preoccupied uncle you weren't quite sure you liked. That's me smoking in the Winnebago, leaving the sink clean of hair. I'm there deadheading the rhubarb nobody bothers to pick and my worthless collections, rag rugs, concrete gnomes were most likely put out in the trash. Sometimes I lied when I was bored. I wanted you to know what I knew, though I eventually gave that up, preferring to make you laugh. This life I led was mostly private and hours were spent sweeping bat guano from a crumbling set of stairs. Nobody knew the half of it, and nobody seemed to care. I foresaw how neglected the town cemetery became, glimpsed 
in a vision the rusted fence that let in the deer. They stripped the bark from the junipers that eventually came down in a storm. I was in that storm, blown out across the ice toward Arcadia. That's a town in Wisconsin and not some name for paradise. Thanks. Mark, thank you so much. And now we're going to open it up to a conversation with Jeff and Chance about the creation of the God of Nothingness. So Jeff and Chance, welcome. Thank you so much, Jared. And thanks, Mark, for that remarkable reading. I'm glad you gave us a little sweep across, um, across the book um, and brought us into Arcadia there at the end as well. And Jared, it's so great to see you, you know, so much love for you, you know, during your years at the loft and so wonderful to see you now at right on door County. So thanks for hosting us. And of course, um, awesome to be here with Chance um, from Gray Wolf and just get a chance to talk with Mark. And then as Jared mentioned, just sort of opening up to the audience. So please put any questions you have for us, um, either, either the artists or the bureaucrats, you can ask us anything. Uh, in the chat or in the in the Q and A, and we'll try to we'll try to get to those too. Um, Chance, maybe we should just introduce ourselves kind of quickly. I don't know if you want to say a little bit uh, about Gray Wolf and and our work, and then maybe we can turn to Mark. Yeah, um, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jared. Uh, it's great to be here. The uh, Gray Wolf Press, you know, an independent nonprofit publisher of literary fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. We do about 33 titles a year, and we are based in my room at the moment, um, <laughs> and, 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 and all, all of our homes uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where our offices are, and one day we'll reopen. Um, I am an editor at Grey Wolf, and I work with Jeff Schatz on the poetry list. We do about nine or 10 poetry titles a year out of the, out of the 30 as a whole. Um, and I started at Grey Wolf as the inaugural Citizen Literary Fellow. Um, and it's just, it's great to be here with Mark now, somebody who, um, whose first two books predate my tenure here, but um, I admire nonetheless. Well, it's such an honor for me. Um, I mean, Mark's been with Grey Wolf now for three of his four books. And it's been sort of remarkable for me as an editor, not only to just work with Mark on each of those books, but to kind of see the, the, the development of, of Mark's um, focus and interest and, um, and craft. And I think we really hear that in Mark's reading tonight, or it certainly struck um, my ear, um, those heroic couplets of poor Cuthbert, uh, for example. Um, Mark, my first thing, and it's just, I had to ask it in front of this particular group and in front of Jared and right on Dork County, is, is with the Earth of Ales and um, now God of Nothingness, I mean, in many ways, I mean, Wisconsin has become a real place of memory and return, and it's a, you know, it's not a simple relationship, and maybe especially in this um, this new book. I mean, there's a sadness that comes with being away from Wisconsin and, and I think a relief. I mean, we hear that in that prodigal son, the kind of, you know, the, the desire to be the prodigal when, when one is the responsible one who stayed and stayed with the family th through the end. Can you talk about, with, you know, your push and pull with your native state and sort of why, especially in these last two books, yeah. that, that setting has become such a, a, a return. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, I, I, I've been working on a, on a series of these very short kind of prose pieces that I'm sort of tentatively calling my 19th century childhood. And, um, and, you know, there's a way in which that, that place in which I grew up, um, growing up in the, you know, 70s and 80s in this very rural uh, part of Wisconsin, it, it very often felt as though it was, you know, in an earlier century. Um, but one of the things about, about that place that remains so, you know, so vivid to me, and it's, it's some place that I, I go back to frequently, right? So my mother is still there living in the house I grew up in. And, um, 
and uh, you know, this year, of course, I haven't I haven't been back in a very long time, but um, but it, it's it's so kind of vivid in my in my imagination. And the other thing is that you know, my family lived in that area since the 1840s, right? Um, first kind of coming there. And so there's generations of, of you know, dead wonderlicks buried in the hills of, of Buffalo County, Wisconsin. And, um, but one of the things that, that it has always struck me about it is that growing up, it was truly the place that culture had passed over. There was no, I couldn't name a single book that was about or was set in that region, but for one, and that's Little House in the Big Woods by Laura Ingalls Wilder, right, in Pepin, Wisconsin. And that was 45 miles away from where I was, right? So there was, you know, the, that there wasn't a, a, a single place. And it really felt like sort of the place that, that, um, that sort of art and culture had passed over. And, um, and part of what I'm doing, I think, is kind of writing about it, writing, you know, writing about that particular region and that place in an attempt to, to say something about it and to kind of um, claim some sort of um, place there. I guess for years, I had, I had also felt as though I was kind of exiled from it. And, and my sense of exile from the place was because of my queerness. And, you know, in growing up, I, I, as soon as I was sort of aware of that, I thought there's no place for me here. There's no way in which I could kind of find a, find a life, make a life for myself. And, you know, then I had the experience of being invited back to give a reading. And I wrote about this, actually, I wrote a, a, an, an essay about it that was in Poets and Writers a couple of years ago, but the experience was so striking in that I showed up for a reading where I really thought there might be 10 people, you know, from Winona State University who would show up. And every, I, I, it was, it was packed. The room was packed with people who, you know, my godparents and my high school German teacher and the home economics teacher and half the congregation of the church I grew up in. And it was this, people, kids I had gone to school with, of course, who are now 50. And, you know, it was this sort of a really shocking experience to walk into a room and have all of these people who kind of returned, I returned and they came to see me. And it, 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 surprised me because my sense of myself and my place there was one that I had left and 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 I had left because there was because I wasn't wanted there in some way right because my presence there wasn't exactly you know um it it, it I couldn't live the kind of life I, I wanted to or needed to do so um it was a surprise when suddenly I was being, you know, kind of welcomed back. And at first this was thrilling to me, you know, I mean, I was so delighted and surprised and I still am, of course, but it made me kind of have to reconsider what my relationship to the place was, right? You know, my own sense of myself had began to alter. I also think that, um, there certainly has been a lot of poetry written about rural experience, but I don't know that there has been a whole lot of poetry written about gay rural experience or sort of queer rural experience. And I sort of want to reclaim some of that. And I find myself, I now I'm, you know, I'm back in a rural place. I live in a very small village in, in rural upstate New York now. And so it seems like I've kind of come full circle in that way. Um, and I'm writing about it the usual story about gay life in America, the stereotypical one is someone born in the provinces moves to the city to refine themselves. You know, that's been the story that we've been told from Willa Cather to, you know, to, to um, any number of, um, of other writers, that's what you do. You know, you're born in the dusty farm and then you come to the city and go to the opera. Um, and, uh, and I certainly did that. Um, I had that, had spent some time doing that, but, um, but I think there's another kind of maybe more complicated story and one that is, is unfamiliar to us a little bit in having, in writing about the kind of, um, queering the rural in some ways. It sounds like an AWP panel. We were talking about that earlier. 
it also sounds very uh, folkloric. I think there's a, a, a good, yeah. good continuing argument for that. But you know, as as you say, with that, there, you know, much of this is nonfiction, and not only you know does the autobiographical impulse or autobiography really kind of feed into this book, but autobiography in itself kind of becomes um, be becomes a subject in, in a way. And from a publishing perspective, you know, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what it's like to work with this kind of autobiographical material over the course of three books and however many years with with one editor, that being specifically Jeff. And if if the editorial process changed changed in any way there, or if kind of your uh, your approach to to submitting the work or to um, to any of that well you know i mean it's been it's it's been such a joy to to work with with jeff on these on these three books um you know we're we're as as we age together jeff as we as we watch our lives passing by i didn't want to say it but i didn't want to say it but that was <laughs> thanks thanks chance um so um you know it's 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 interesting. I mean, I guess I think about um, autobiography as being a kind of material. It's the it's the sort of thing that I mine. But but I also don't really think of. I, I don't feel particularly exposed by writing about autobiographical material. You know, I I I feel that. Um, a kind of um, nuanced approach to it has to uh, you know. Um, uh, careful readers will understand that when we talk about autobiography and poems, we understand that this is something that's being that that is being manipulated, of course, and that is being altered uh, in order to kind of fit it into the into the poem. Um, you know, I would say that um, you know the things in the poems are are men are true for the most part, but then there are all of the things that I'd exclude it. Right there's all of the things that were not included, and you know, so there's no way, of course, to capture the fullness of experience when you are writing using that first-person pronoun. Right when you're sort of putting in that one single letter, how is that supposed to represent fully represent the self? Um, that said, I I feel kind of you know I I like telling stories. You know, I like amusing people by telling amusing stories, and and um, and that stems from per experiences I've had, mostly from personal experience, and I, it's much of the way I approach my poems, I guess. Um, and uh, you know that that there are fictions in them, but there are also truths, and um, and I think there are probably more truths than fictions. Well, and there's. And there's such an interesting way in this new book. I mean, it's true for all your books, but thinking of God of Nothingness in particular, and you, you read quite a bit from that first section in the book that the, the, what you're calling the fairy tale, but, but, that was just, but that was just your life. That was just your, you know, your nonfiction um, that you were writing your childhood. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued though that, um, you kind of scoff a little bit at the sort of fairy tale I idea, or it's seen that way from readers or reviewers and critics and so on. But it, it's not just what's interesting to me in thinking about it and just thinking about it tonight is, is that um, it doesn't exist just at the level of subject matter. It's not just the, the sort of backwater small, you know, the, the hinterland childhood, that, that sense of isolation, that sense of bringing up, you know, livestock that, you know, like Cuthbert and going to the fair and, and you know, and, and those things, that's all there. Um, but your use of those couplets mm. and particularly the use of rhyme and end rhyme to me also enhances a kind of, you know, as you're saying, a manipulated or an artificial and arted way of writing about that material that does feel quite fairy tale really in its composition whether that was conscious or not is an interesting question to me mm. well you know i mean I, I, that i found myself writing these poems so many poems that are rhyming 
um, was a surprise to me. And it became like a, a compulsion, you know, it, it became a thing that, that felt a little out of my control. I, I, there's something, I, you know, there's no experience to me that, that I can, in writing this book that was more pleasurable than, than getting the kind of machinery of the poem moving along. And suddenly these rhymes just started to happen. And it became like this engine that was driving it forward. And one sound led to another sound and led to another sound. And that was, that was, it was thrilling. It's, it made me kind of giddy when I was doing it. It felt a little manic. It felt a little, you know, um, uh, slightly out of control, a little loony even, you know, and I think of the way, um, I love the way Plath rhymes in, you know, in Ariel, the, those kinds of internal rhymes, the, the, the storybook kind of rhyming that she does. I'm certain I had that in my head. I have so many of those poems in my head all the time. Um, I wrote some of this book while at the James Merrill house um, when I had a residency there and talk about loony. I mean, that house is so odd. It's just like the greatest, weirdest, you know, I mean, painted like watermelon sunburn, you know, color and the Ouija boards and these like mat, you know, invisible doors that you push through and the dusty opera records and the purple Birkenstocks and the goo gaws every Everywhere. And I mean, it's just like, it's this kooky, modest place where this, you know, bazillionaire lived and wrote his poems and listened to opera records and entertained and, you know, lived this kind of libertine life in the elephant graveyard of Stonington, Connecticut, you know, I mean, it's, it was, it's a sort of astonishing place, but I, when I was there, I was kind of inspired by just how eccentric this place was, how he just didn't, he just bent the world toward his own inner, it felt like being inside of his head when you were in that, in that house. And it's incredibly modest. This man could have lived anywhere. He could have lived in any giant mansion that he wanted. Instead, it was this like musty, fusty, you know, um, dilapidating, house in this, you know, Stonington. And I felt some something about being in there kind of gave me a sense of freedom about, about just doing, you know, writing these poems. And, and I, a friend who I show my poems to often, she reliably thinks my poems are hilarious. And, you know, even I, and when I write them, I sort of know that she's going to laugh. And even a poem like Cuthbert, she just thought that this was like hilarious, right? She thinks that these sort of gothic, strange poems are just a hoot. And I, I, um, and I, I also find there's this humor in these poems. And partly the rhyme for me is, is, a, is, is meant, I want these poems to engage. I want people to be to feel a little giddy, to feel like there's something maybe a little out of control in them, to sense that there is maybe something, these, these might have the chance of kind of going off the rails a little bit. And, um, and, and that kind of keeps a reader on their toes, you know? I mean, and if I was able to reproduce some of that, um, I'm glad, right? Um, I didn't expect to be writing a lot of poems that were rhyming. But partly too, I wrote a lot of these poems quite rapidly. There was a period of about a month where sometimes I was writing one or two a day. And, you know, it was, it was, it had this sense of I needed to get it all down. I needed to take advantage of this moment. It was happening. I, I just need to write the next poem and write the next poem and just make sure as long as possible to see if I can extend this and keep it going. And um, and so. I, I felt fell into this pattern of rhyming, and uh, and it just kind of drove me forward. Um, we're loading up on questions from from the audience right now, so I was just going to sneak one in, and Jeff, you know, um, and I'm actually going to try to combine two of them uh, here, but from um, Chris, uh, I'm so sorry, Chris uh, Begalk and uh, Greg Nickel. Um, we have a, how do you think that growing up in a rural area prepared you to be a poet? 
and then also you use so many international references uh, in your work, though it seems seamless to the reader. Uh, how does that separation or influence challenge the poems when so much of it is so rooted in the US? Um, well, let's see. So um, how did growing up in a real place prepare me to be a poet? Um, boredom. Um, and uh, solitude. Um, you know, I, 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 um, I don't think I've ever really been bored a day in my life. You know, this is, this is the, I've done boring things, but, um, you know, been in boring meetings, but I don't think like left to my own devices that I've ever been bored. Right, I'm way too preoccupied. Like I have way too much going on upstairs. Like to you know sort of find myself without something going on. And and I think like when you grow up in a rural place, um, it, it's it's uh, you know there were no, there were no there was just my brother. There were like no kids around. There was no neighborhood. Like I was out on a farm. Like it was you know um, it was just us and the animals and, you know, each other and like trying to kill each other half the time, you know? So it was, that was sort of part of it. And I, I you just become sort of self, um, you cultivate inner resources. Like you learn how to kind of entertain yourself. And for me, it was to become a reader, you know, that, that became the most important thing. And it was the way in which I escaped, the way in which I amused myself and, and eventually the way in which I found my way into the world was through, was through books. I would say the other thing that being in a rural place has done for me as a poet is to connect me to the kind of natural cycles in the world, you know, to, to um, have these kind of, to really be connected to the seasons, to be connected to things like raising food, slaughtering animals, hunting, um, you know, the, the, the sort of small town cycles of, 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 you know, church and school and, you know, those, those being kind of the centers of your life and community. Um, all of that, I think, has given me, has given me so much material, so much to think about and write about. Um, Chance, maybe you can help me in the second part of the question, uh, what, what the, what it was. It, it, it's it's how the distinction between the international references, oh, yeah, um, and, yeah, and the poems in the U.S. kind of functions or challenges you. Yeah, so there are a number of poems here that you know. There's a a, a section of poems and uh, that are um, five cold stories in which I I uh, travel to areas north of the Arctic Circle um, or near the Arctic Circle and wrote about them. And um, there's a poem that's sort of set in Germany. I know in in Vorpsveda. So, um, you know, I, I, for me, these things are sort of all, they're, they're kind of all tied together. I, I somehow see them all as being, being linked. Um, you know, many of the, there's a lot of, there's a certain amount of German language that's happening in the poems, like when in the poem, Ha Ha Little Hunchback, there's a phrase, Fisch stehst du boop. This was my grandfather who I was writing about there. And he, you know, he, he would, use these German phrases all the time. It was, you know, and uh, um, his family spoke German. I heard people, old people in my community speaking German. There was, you know, part of a church service in German when I was growing up. It was really kind of everywhere around still, but dying out. Like by, not in the, by the time we were in the 1980s, only the old people still, really old people still spoke this. But, you know, I have kids who's, you know, other people my age growing up there, their, their parents, you know, one of my, my best friend's father's first language was Norwegian, you know? And um, so, I mean, there were these other languages that were sort of around, but they really were dying off. So that's in, there in the distance, you know, uh, around. And then, um, and then there is this sort of travel. So I think, um, I don't quite know how to answer that question exactly, but I think that, you know, I've written about my own experiences in the last couple of years, certainly about these deaths and certainly about travel, um, which has been a source of, you know, which I, I love to do, I miss desperately. And, um, and it's often been a source of, of subjects for me.
chance. Should we look at some more questions here while we have time? Sounds great. If I uh, could ask a question that is also related to one that came into the chat from, from Ann Heisey. She wanted to know how finished were the poems when they arrived on Jeff's desk and how many changes did he suggest? And I'm also wondering, as I have the advanced reader's copy, how much changes from, from this to what is now out in, in bookstores? Jeff, that's for you. That's, yeah, that's, a, well, the first part I'll answer and then maybe I'll let Chance answer the second part. Um, Mark holds his cards fairly close. And I think that's a Wisconsin <laughs> attribute too, which is to say that to answer the question, I, I get Mark's manuscripts and there, there's a wholeness to them. There, there's, a, there's a level of completion that is there from the beginning and it's very tactile to me. Um, so uh, it makes my work, I think, as an editor in terms of working with Mark across these books and maybe not surprisingly, um, this is only more the case, I think, as um, the books accrue and, and I've been able to work on them is that they're very polished. And I mean, as you can hear from Mark, there is so much texture inside the lines, but there is also a finished quality, you know, use of rhyme, use of form, use of the prose poem, use of all these things. So um, I, I, I feel like things are already at an incredibly high level by the time I'm even first looking at a full manuscript. Um, for example, the, the title of this book was always the title of, of this book, at least as I came to know it. Uh, Mark may have had earlier titles that I never saw, but that, that was always the the landing place. One of the interesting things, I mean, in terms of, of is really looking at the structure of the collection. So I try to think as an editor as much about um, the, the line and the unit and the poem, um, but I'm also really interested in how books are built and how they're made and structured and organized. I mean, and one of the bold things that happened was uh, Mark didn't read it tonight, but th this this book opens with a re really remarkable poem that is is very funny and not funny, and it's just titled Wonderlick. And I, th I don't know that I have seen a poet open a book, uh, um, you know, that <laughs> directly <laughs> uh, 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 engaging with the history of one's name, whether that that history is partially invented or nonfiction or in a fairy tale reality or all those things happening in that poem. But that poem used to be fairly deep in the book. And one of the things, you know, making that poem first and then seeing on the other end of the collection, uh, a long poem called On the Autobiographical Impulse, which is a um, enthralling, um, upsetting poem you know, that creates a huge tension in terms of this poem's engagement with Mark's life, what we believe about it, what we don't, what's the storytelling happening, what's the truth telling, what's, what's the artifice. So I'm, I'm interested in, in, as an editor in those, what, what tensions get torqued and built um, around the collection. And that was one change that was really exciting. The reason I was also asking Mark earlier about rhyme is as you're hearing in that first section, that fairy tale section where there's, there's the rhyme and the craft and the childhood story is being told. And then we go into these travel poems or poems about art making uh, um, and so on that, that leave the home. I mean, in, in one way, this is a coming of age book in a certain way, but it pretty quickly leaves that fairy tale world. So I love the arc of this book is, how, how do I get away from this place? And how is it that I'm inevitably by the end finding myself re you know, helplessly returning to it is at least one of the dramas of this book. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about as an editor and, you know, and then doing everything from fact checking various translations and doing you know, that kind of um, textual work alongside Chance and alongside Mark. Um, but really interested in sort of those organizational questions. 
And then Chance, why don't you answer Jared's question about what happens with that advanced reader's copy, that ARC, and then the, the proofs and from there. Yeah, I, I think it's um, fitting the the content matches the um, the the method here in how completely dramatically less interesting my <laughs> answer answer is to that. Where I feel like you know, particularly I think with a poet like Mark, where when the poems come through, you know, after so rigorously being you know scoured over just to an exacting degree. Um, it's it's things that change between that advanced reader's copy, Jared, that you have, and this, you know the, the finished copy. That sometimes I wonder if anybody would ever even notice, aside from from uh, you know per, per, perhaps Jeff and Mark and I. And, and, but um, yeah, it's 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 little things. It's things for consistency. It's things for for uh, cleanliness. It's things for for style. It's just uh, it's it's very often. Um, really going through with a level of thoroughness that uh, borders on redundancy in in the interest of just being as as diligent as possible and trying to make uh, something that has never existed, which is a perfect book in in that one sense. Um, yeah. And I will keep talking and go to another uh, question from the audience here. Um, and this one says, uh, from Isam Zene, uh, the book opens with Rilke. Um, did Mark's Rilke scholarship feed its way into the poems? And I actually selfishly am picking this one, Mark, because I would love to just kind of hear you talk about, about Rilke and your, your relationship. So, um, hey, Isam, thank you for that question. And um, um, Yes, you know, it, it did, certainly. I, I, I sort of, while this, while I was working on this book, um, I ha was also reading, sort of plunged headlong into a, a kind of longer project of reading and re-entering into, into Rilke's work and, and thinking about it, particularly the Duino elegies. And my reason for that was, you know, that many of these poems are elegiac in tone. They're sort of thinking about, about that act of memorializing the dead. But as I was, you know, um, what's so interesting, I think, about, um, about the Duino elegies is that they are called elegies, but what in fact are they, are they elegizing? You know, it's, it's, it's never exactly clear. It's not a person. It's not, you know, there are individuals who are mentioned, but it's not the day of his death was a dark, cold day. You know, it's not that kind of an elegy. It's um, those poems, Rilke's, Rilke's Duino elegies are these sort of sweeping, um, shifting um, uh, poems that seem to be kind of mourning the human condition, right? They seem to be thinking about the idea of mortality generally and, and, um, and creating all of these sort of perceptual changes. So, you know, um, I was just talking about this the other day. He is in a line where he talks about, he doesn't say that you, we need the spring. He says, the spring needs you. You know, he, he's always sort of reversing, creating these kind of uh, reversals of perception that are meant to, to make strain, make the world more strange. And, and um, gesturing toward this idea of a kind of spiritual reality that, that lies just beyond the world we occupy. And this from Rilke, uh, someone who was not a believer, right? He was not, he did not believe in an afterlife. He did not believe that our consciousness remains intact and that we sort of, you know, um, move on to, the, to another realm sort of seamlessly. Um, and so I think that in spending a lot of time with those poems that that was in the background. There's also the kind of wonderful thing about the Duino elegies is that they're really weird. They're super strange, you know, and they're, they're um, you know, you have, he, he's thinking about angels and puppets and animals and bats. And, you know, he's got all of these kind of things that he refers to um, and, uh, and so I, it felt like a kind of license to, 
to inhabit that world. Um, those poems of his too, I think are kind of, you know, Rilke's the sort of last, I think of him as like the last European romantic poet who, you know, is forced into modernism um, uh, in, in those, in these poems in some way, it's a book of kind of real transition. And I guess I also was thinking, you know, he finished this book when he was, he finished the Duino elegies when he was like 50. This is sort of when I was writing these, you know, these poems for this book too. So I don't know, I was just kind of absorbed in that, in that work and in that world. And I've been working, writing nonfiction about that experience of reading his poems too. So, um, so that is definitely in the background, I think, you know, he's, he's definitely somewhere there um, as I was writing these poems, how he's, it's influenced the work more directly. There is a poem um, that is um, called Proposition in the poem. It's set in Vorpsfede, which was a town where he lived in Germany, where I had gone um, on, you know, one of those sort of preposterous literary pilgrimages where you go to these places and find nothing, you know, and there's nothing left. Just read the book. You could have stayed home. Um, but that's, you know, so there's that sense. I sort of went to those places and, and yet one sort of does find something there um, a little bit too. So there's one poem that, that does think about that. So thanks for the question, Isam. I think we've got time for one more. Um, so I have one from um, Aye Bende Amadi, and it's um, my copy of God of Nothingness arrived in the mail almost as a guide or how to for tracking a letter that came the same day from an old dear friend about the loss of his wife this year. Um, it feels like a book about connections, the ones we intend and the accidental things we remember most of all. Um, I'm interested to know what are some of these connections that you've had that stand out most for you or, or motivate writing for you? Well, I think, um, you know, uh, it, it's so much of, I've, I've, I've sort of talked about this elsewhere. So if anyone has heard me, heard me say this before, I, you know, please forgive the repetition, but in 2018, it was a year in which eight people I was close to died. And um, and it sort of began at the beginning of the at, at the beginning of the year when sort of older relatives died, and then, you know, my godparents died, and then my uncle died, and then a student. Um, she was a an adult student who you know had two kids, and we had she had been my student, and we were starting a friendship. She died suddenly. Um, then you know uh, Lucy Brock Broido, who had been my teacher and who was a friend, died um quite suddenly as well then jd mcclatchy who had been my other teacher and mentor and friend also died um my friend john committed suicide and at the end of that year my father died after a long illness so it was a it was a lot and it was and also during that time it um we sold the family farm it was which was a task that i undertook um to do so it was a it was a period where it was all all about, you know, saying goodbye to things, you know, these things are passing out of my life, big things that were passing out of my life, and not just familial connections or connections to this place, but these connections to, you know, deep friendships and, but also to these two forces that made me a poet, right? These two people who taught me, who mentored me, who took me under their wing and had brought me into the world. So it was a really a time to kind of wake up and reimagine what one's life is going to be, to grow up finally, and to, you know, be really kind of see myself as, you know, this is this is your life. It's, you know, you're gonna have to figure out how to how to live a life when when all around you you're losing things. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, I wrote poems about those subjects because, you know, I want experience to mean something. Um, I want what we go through in the world to actually 
not to just be, you know, I don't, I don't want to just go through the world and experience loss or pain and just, and just have that be what happens. I want it to actually have some, to have meaning. And for me, the way in which I can assign meaning to it is by writing about it, is by turning it into something durable. And the most durable thing that I know how to make is a poem. Um, and so that's, I think, what it, it's, I, I don't really believe in poetry as therapy. There are much more efficient ways to engage in therapy than to write poems about subjects, right? That, you know, um, I, I, think, I think of writing poems as the making of complex individual works of art. Um, that's, what they, that's what they are to me. And, and, but in doing that, they allow me to, to fasten meaning, meaning to something, to fix something in time, to make this sort of object that I can hold away from myself and see it. And it, and it, it allows me to kind of then set it down you know, to sort of, and, and move on to the next thing, whatever that may be. It makes meaningless loss. It makes it, makes it comprehensible and it actually gives it some sort of a way in which I can, can enter into it. One of the things that I really love about Rilke's poems, particularly the, the Duino elegies, I've sort of described them earlier this week. They're, to me, it's like, I know those poems so well at this point, they're like rooms that I can enter into. They're like spaces that I can actually inhabit. And when I reread those poems, I walk into them. There it's sort of the alarm is, is speaking to us right now, speaking of a fairy tale. And, um, and to occupy those rooms, to sort of live inside those poems um, is so reassuring, right? It's, it's, it's not, you know, those poems are unsettling, they mourn, they create strange juxtapositions, but the furniture is all familiar to me. I know where everything is. And that for me is the joy of reading and rereading poems. It's like why I love them in the first place. They, they create a kind of psychic and spiritual space you can occupy. And when I write poems, that's what I wanna make. I wanna make those things. And I'm making them of what I have experienced in the world and someone else can go into them. And that, that means I'm not gonna be in there by myself, you know? Um, so I don't know, I think that's, that's probably the best answer I can give to that question. Mark, thank you so much, Chance and Jeff. It was a wonderful conversation and such a great look into how, how editors work with their poets. So thank you all so very much. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good night and we'll hope to see you again. If there was a question about, will Mark be in residence at Right On? We're working on it. I would love to see that happen. So thank you all. Thanks, Have everybody. a good night.